maybe located in different physical territories. I and the Department of Sociology want to acknowledge that that many indigenous nations have long-standing relationships with the territories on which York cases are located that precede the establishment of the university. We acknowledge that uh, the presence of uh, on the, the its presence on the traditional territory of many nations, the area of uh, known as Tacaranto has been caretaken by the Anishinaabek Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Huron Wendat, and is now home to many First Nation, Inuit, and Métis communities. We acknowledge the current treaty holders, the uh, Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. And this territory is subject to the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement to peaceably share and care for the Great Lakes region, both Buffalo and Toronto, and all of the areas around it. I encourage you, wherever you are, to look into the, uh, the history and the knowledge uh, and the presence uh, of Indigenous nations on the territories that you are on right now. I am thrilled to welcome Mike Davis today as he gives the 2021 annual lecture in the Department of Sociology at York. It's such an honor. Uh, and before I introduce uh, Professor Davis fully, a few brief logistics and thank yous. As you've probably noticed, the talk is being recorded and shared on YouTube. Um, during the talk, if we can turn off our cameras and mics in order to ensure that we have the best connection that we can, I'm gonna put on the, um, the closed captioning as well. If the, you find it distracting, you can turn it off personally, but I think it's useful for those who need it. Um, once the talk's over, Mike's offered to give us a few more minutes of his time to answer some questions. And so to do that, we're gonna use the blue participant hand. Um, and if you go down to the bottom, you see participants, pop that open, you'll find the place to put up your hand. I want to say thank you to our staff, especially Sue Foster and Jackie Siebert and Rita Kanarik um, for uh, supporting uh, the event, to the research committee, particularly Marcello Musto and Ann Kim for organizing this. Uh, it's so great, especially in times in the pandemic, we need that we can come together, learn and think together. Okay. To this end, I want to introduce Mike Davis. He is the Distinguished Emeritus Professor at the University of California, Riverside, and has numerous publications, including City of Courts, Excavating the Future in Los Angeles, Late Victorian Holocausts, El Nino Famines and the Making of the Third World. And his most recent books are The Monster Enters, COVID-19, Avian Flu and the Plagues of Capitalism uh, out in 2020, and Set the Night on Fire, LA in the 60s with John Wiener, uh, also 2020. I wanna say a big welcome to Mike Davis, thank you. Hand it over to you. It's a great honor to be invited to give this talk. And it gives me the opportunity to acknowledge my debt to Leo Panitch. 30 years ago, he brought me to York to teach political economy for fall semester. And like many of you, I was touched for life by his warmth, passion and optimism. He was also one of the funniest people around. Great crack, as my Irish older daughter would say. God, Leo, we miss you. Today's talk has been modified from the original description and divided into two parts. First, I look at diverse national political responses to the COVID-19 pandemic, suggesting some criteria for comparative evaluation and ranking selected countries according to their successes in controlling the outbreak. Secondly, I take the USA as a case study where executive power was used to deliberately undermine the public health response, leading to hundreds of thousands of unnecessary deaths. Even with the defeat of Trump, Republicans continue on multiple fronts, particularly in red state legislatures, to obstruct efforts to enforce masking and business closures. Absurdly enough, pandemic denialism remains live and well in large parts of my country. <clears throat> You'll have to forgive me, I may cough a lot during this talk. So first let's try and paint a crude comparative picture of global political responses. We need two different sets of criteria. The first to characterize state and social capacities 
to conduct effective antiviral campaigns, and the second to define and compare outcomes. National income is an obvious starting point. Using conventional UN definitions of high, medium, and low income countries. In addition, we want to know their coefficients, is their degree of income inequality, and the percentage of population in deep poverty. It may be that inequality is, is important, perhaps more so than GDP. Next, we need indices of the capacity of national health systems to respond to major medical emergencies. Obvious criteria are health expenditures per capita, population coverage and affordability, the quality of primary, primary uh, care, pre-pandemic planning and awareness, and surge capacity measured by extra emergency wards, hospital beds, and stockpiles of protective equipment and drugs. <clears throat> and perhaps most importantly, we would want to know whether the trend of investment in primary care has been rising or falling since 2000. I'd put medical R&D in a separate category. Here we'd like to gauge capacities for disease surveillance and vaccine development, as well as the existence of a national pharmaceutical manufacturing base. We also want to know the relative roles of the private and public sectors in research and drug manufacturing. A baseline national health index is obviously critical. It would include measures of nutrition, sanitation, levels of chronic diseases, epidemic diseases, and racial and class health inequality. Then we need to consider political capacities for the implementation of pandemic response. Some questions are obvious. Is there a national pandemic strategy with a responsible peak authority? Does the executive have effective power to compel the private sector to produce <coughs> needed personal protective equipment? critical care technology and pharmaceuticals? Does it have the means to implement the strategy at all levels, overriding if necessary regional and local governments? Can it ensure clear, consistent, uncensored public messaging based on scientific facts? And crucially, can it mobilize grassroots participation through mass party memberships and or self-organization at the community and civil society levels. Finally, what public commitments have been given to provide international aid? Has the country kept up to date with its contributions to the WHO, dedicated a proportion of its vaccine stockpile to the relief of poor nations, and shared vital scientific information, whether patented or not? <coughs> Okay, so that's one set of parameters. The other defines relative success and failure in managing the pandemic. The first group of countries are those who've been successful. <coughs> Pardon me for a second. Are those who have been successful in containing the first and subsequent waves of infection, albeit with some moments of great difficulty. There are also countries moving efficiently with vaccine production and distribution. The second group are wealthy countries with universal health care that through inconsistent or incoherent policies have failed to control the first and or the second waves. And third category are several countries that from early on adopted a herd immunity strategy based on voluntary public compliance rather than official mass mandates or uh, closures. And fourthly, are the three large nations, United States, Brazil, and Mexico, which together account for 40% of the Earth's uh, COVID mortality, where presidential authority directly attacked public health measures, 
endorsed pandemic denialism and promoted quack medicines and conspiracy theories. Now, I leave a big chunk of the world out of this, including most Sub-Saharan and South Asian nations, because <coughs> there appears to be a radical under counting of pandemic mortality and poor record keeping, but also unexpected demographic and immune factors that have tapped deaths below initial model projections. In the New Yorker this week, the brilliant Dr. Ryder Siddhartha Mukherjee explores sorry, explores the paradox of apparent low mortality in Africa and Indian slums. He emphasizes no singular simple explanation and that the jury remains out on basic facts. <coughs> so additional conclusions can we draw from informal comparisons of national capacities and disease outcomes? First of all, there is the shocking example of very wealthy and well-resourced European nations who failed to contain either the first and or the second wave. Indeed, the five countries <coughs> with the world's highest death rates per 1,000 population are in order. Belgium, Slovenia, the Czech Republic, the UK, Italy, and Portugal. Spain is close behind. Both France and Sweden have higher per capita mortality than Brazil, South Africa, or Iran. While Switzerland is substantially higher than Poland or Romania. In Europe, in other words, it seems that national capacity, as I defined it, <coughs> stands in an inverse relationship to success in controlling infections. Only West Germany, Cyprus, Finland, Norway, and of course Iceland are undisputed exceptions to this paradoxical de decoupling between national resources and pandemic outcomes. How do we explain this? Not easily, although some factors are obvious. In the Italian case, for instance, political instability and weak national leadership combined with denialism on the right and opposition to quarantines by small businesses provides core elements of an explanation. Political turmoil has also played a role in Spain. <coughs> <coughs> In Spain, augmented by tremendous pressure from the tourist vacation home sectors opening. France, Belgium, and the Netherlands should probably be bracketed together as cases where inconsistent policies, again, influenced by resistance in the retail sector, led to serious winter outbreaks. With few exceptions, far-right political parties have embraced Trumpian disinformation and use anti-masking and anti-closure protests to garner new support. <coughs> then there are the two countries that adopted with disastrous results a herd immunity strategy. In Sweden, a country addicted to the increasingly groundless belief in its national exceptionalism this was public policy supported by leading medical experts and stubbornly maintained long after public health statistics had demonstrated its failure. Britain, for its part, has been Europe's worst case scenario with over 125,000 deaths. Ceaseless Tory attacks on the budget of its celebrated National Health Service left it ill prepared to deal with the exponential increase of COVID during the spring. In contrast to Sweden, the Johnson cabinet, as several major exposés have shown, adopted herd immunity in secret, with one eminent squeeze whispering to his friends 
that the death of thousands of pensioners was a small price to pay to save the economy. To the horror of its two major medical journals, several of the government's most high profile medical advisors endorsed this de facto policy and the Brexit right, joyously infected by Trumpian denialism, mobilized to keep the company open and dying. Now, the collective achievement of the industrial East Asian nations, plus Thailand, in controlling the pandemic stand in the sharpest contrast to the chaotic policies and failed containment efforts in most Western European countries. All members of this block are characterized by strong developmental states, but they, of course, have very different systems of government ranging from parliamentary democracies like Taiwan, South Korea, and Japan, <coughs> to autocratic party-based regimes such as China, Vietnam, and Singapore. But they share come several important common features. Robust pandemic planning as a result of previous scares with avian flu and SARS, a long tradition of mass wearing in summer wearing in winter flu seasons. Pharmaceutical sectors, advanced pharmaceutical sectors that are largely interconnected, and perhaps most importantly, the ability to recruit and effectively use public involvement in anti epidemic campaigns. In the case of China in particular, we should be dubious of claims that it's incontestable success was due simply to repressive powers and the political dictatorship of the party. <coughs> a few weeks ago, I blurred a, a book compiled by uh, Chinese New Left dissidents that recounts in detail the crucial role of community of neighborhood volunteers and the pirate social media in fighting both COVID and government censorship in Wuhan. Social solidarity in China, the authors emphasize, is not simply imposed from the top down, but thrives independently in the grassroots. <coughs> Two poorer countries, Vietnam and Cuba, <coughs> have been especially successful in holding mortality to the mere hundreds. <coughs> <coughs> Indeed, Australia's Loving Institute, which tracks COVID trends in 98 countries, ranks Vietnam second only to New Zealand. <coughs> in, in performance, Cuba uh, is not actually included in the, in the levy list. Both countries have strong systems of community health care, staff by paramedical personnel, and both have world-class medical expertise. <laughs> In Vietnam, the Pasteur Institutes in Hanoi and Ho Chi Minh City have been fighting epidemic disease for more than a century and led the successful fight against avian flu in the early 2000s. Cuba, meanwhile, leads Latin America, even Brazil, in the development of cutting edge vaccines and biotechnology. Indeed, it's expected to complete clinical trials on its own COVID vaccine by this spring. <laughs> <coughs> One second, please. Do you wanna take a five minute break, Mike? No, I'm, I'll continue. I'll still be coughing even if I take a break. Yeah, no worries, no worries. Okay, just if you need to, please do. Perfect. <coughs> Some other conclusions <coughs> that we should draw. Key transnational institutions, especially the World Health Organization and the European Union, were entirely marginalized during most of 2020. By formal agreement, the WHO is supposed to be the lead agency internationally, but its major signatory countries largely ignored it with the US attacking it as a front for Chinese foreign policy and withdrawing its membership and funding. 
From the case of the European Union, healthcare is nationally independent, but members are obligated by treaty to provide mutual aid in cases of grave national natural uh, emergencies, including pandemics. When Italy last April invoked this statute, France, Austria, and other members immediately sealed their borders and prevented the export of medical goods. <coughs> Only China and Cuba <coughs> quickly responded to Italy's pleas, with certain exceptions, such as Norway, Sweden, and Luxembourg. Wealthy North Atlantic countries, with the US as the extreme case, have pursued entirely nationalistic paths. <coughs> hoarding medical supplies and competing to corner personal protective equipment and vaccines. Canada, by the way, is considered by many to be the worst hoarder since it's ordered enough vaccine to cover the population five times over. The nationalism of the rich has stood the way for China and now Russia and India to become the leaders in vaccine distribution to poor countries. A fact that will have, uh, that obviously will, will have significant geopolitical consequences. But even with an acceleration of their efforts, no more than 10% of the people in the world's 70 poorest countries <coughs> are expected to be vaccinated this year. <coughs> I know this is an ordeal for listeners, I'm sorry. At this point, I should emphasize that even relatively successful countries, which have heard, adhered to science, such as Norway and Canada, have experienced deadly outbreaks, preventable outbreaks in senior care, <coughs> in senior care facilities. In the United States, where such facilities are almost entirely privatized, Resident mortality is accounted for a shocking 40% of the national total. <coughs> Several hundred thousand unnecessary deaths. The moral stain of these massacres will never be expunged. Let's now turn to the darkest side of all this. <clears throat> Trump's stunning 2016 victory has often been depicted as the mass revolt of low-income whites. This is misleading. Although enough blue-collar Democrats in the upper Midwest were enticed by his promises of reindustrialization to narrowly swing four battleground states to his side. <coughs> the more prosaic fact is that he won by recapitulating Romney's vote total in 2012. 2012, while Clinton dramatically underperformed Obama in the battlegrounds. <coughs> Moreover, Trump's performance was based on support from the evangelical and Tea Party right that he procured <coughs> by letting them write the Republican platform. Despite the wild impulsive acts that he characterized <coughs> his administration, he was consistent in pursuing their core agenda, which included packing the high courts, rolling back civil rights and environmental protections, kicking families off food stamps, and destroying Obamacare. Though the last narrowly survived legislative and judicial challenges, thanks in part to the Republican lack of an alternative, it defined from the outset the regime's negligent and often hostile attitude toward public health institutions. However, in the first phase of the, of the pandemic, from New Year's Day to 
uh, mid or late March, the administration's mishaps can be blamed on executive inattention and organizational incompetence more than upon deliberate sabotage. This included the February debacle when the Centers for Disease Control released a contaminated test set that gave false results. <coughs> <coughs> then compounded the crisis by refusing for weeks to authorize the use of reliable alternatives available from the World Health Organization and independent US labs. As a result, containment efforts based on identification, quarantine, and contact tracing entirely collapsed. The first wave of mortality spreading like wildfire through nursing home residents and, and staff. <coughs> In March, following the dramatic plunge in stock prices, Trump reluctantly acknowledged the pandemic, but immediately undermined his own health experts by announcing that he would not wear a mask. <coughs> well, deaths increased exponentially. He texted incessantly about the great job he was doing. In conversations with his advisors, however, he betrayed more anxiety and repeatedly raised the idea of letting the disease run its course in order to avoid further economic distress. Some of his friends, including that paleo reactionary, Texas Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick, <coughs> and Fox News favorite quack doctor, Matt Medaz, were loudly pushing this herd immunity screen. Patrick indeed told Fox that, quote, Lots of grandparents were willing to die in order to save the economy. We got to take risks to get back in the game and get this country up and running. The decisive <coughs> watershed occurred in mid April when the White House, recognizing that the pandemic was out of control, decided to shift responsibility for combating it to under-resourced state governments. They called this the state authority handoff, while others characterized it as Darwinian federalism, since it let the 50 states to eat amongst themselves for essential supplies. In any event, the New York Times would characterize it as, quote, a catastrophic policy blunder, perhaps one of the greatest failures of presidential leadership in generations. But blunder became criminal conspiracy soon afterwards, Trump and the Republican leaders realized they could weaponize the pandemic by attacking the Democratic governors who were desperately trying to fill the holes left by the White House's abdication. This would recast Republicans as defenders of blue collar jobs and small businesses against Democratic elites and their unwanted mass mandates and quarantines. <coughs> Since, <coughs> since the top down orchestrated the Tea Party in 2010, right wing republicanism is used to extremate parliamentary protests as an integral part of its electoral strategy. <coughs> so Trump quickly turned to his Tea Party allies to unleash phony populist wrath. The quote, Save Our Country Coalition, whose Leadership is a virtual who's who of the post Reagan far right. Launch mob attacks and state capitals, while red state crowds rejoiced in unmasked Trump rallies, which of course became super spreader events. At the same time, the protection of employers who were responsible for unsafe working conditions became the number one administration priority rather than the life and death of their workers. The Occupational Health and Safety Administration, a branch of the US Labor Department, received a torrent of complaints, <coughs> a torrent of complaints about 
unsafe working conditions from meatpacking workers, farm laborers, Amazon employees, and other groups of essential workers. It refused to process any of them. Instead, the White House, which was stubbornly refusing to use the Defense Production Act to accelerate manufacture of masks and ventilators, forcefully invoked the act to compel meat industry employees to return to processing lines where they stand shoulder to shoulder for long hours in the cold. In addition, Eugene Scalia, the Secretary of Labor and the son of the of the deceased conservative hero and Supreme Court Justice Annan and Scalia ruled that workers who refused to return to the job because of fear of infection were ineligible for expanded unemployment benefits. <coughs> Indeed, he threatened that they should be treated as potential felons engaged in unemployment fraud. At the Labor Department's urging, red states began to set up internet, internet hotlines to allow employers to anonymously report such individuals. Simultaneously, Mitch McConnell, the Senate Majority Leader, was crusading to eliminate the most potent sanction <coughs> against employers who failed to protect their workers. It's the threat of lawsuits. He made Republican support for further aid to stricken states conditional on grants of blanket immunity to employers. But he had no problem with delivering hundreds of million dollars of relief aid to the private equity investors who control most of the corrupt nursing home industry or to private hospital chains, even corporate law firms. <laughs> what was the result? <coughs> According to a recent widely publicized report in Lancet, about 40% of the U.S.'s COVID-19 mortality, quote, could have been adverted had the U.S. death rate mirrored the weighted average of other G7 nations. Lancet's investigating commission set up in 2017 to monitor the health policy impacts of the Trump administration squarely indicts him as coronavirus vector numero uno. Quote, instead of galvanizing the U.S. populace to fight the pandemic, President Trump publicly dismissed its threat despite privately acknowledging it, discouraged action as infection spread and eschewed international cooperation. This is a welcome judgment, but it's misleading in some respects. Trump, for instance, not only attempted to sabotage and discredit the efforts of federal and state public health officials, he did so with an obvious political purpose <coughs> to expand a right-wing base already built on foundations of climate denialism, religious superstition, and the perception that most scientists are the servants of secretive elites. Lancet seems willing to charge negligent, negligent manslaughter, but second degree murder is obviously the more appropriate charge. <coughs> the 200,000 preventable deaths estimated by the British Medical Journal were victims of an election strategy designed to play off jobs against public health. <coughs> and largely because of the failure of the Democrats to pick up the job issues and campaign aggressively around the policy that the best way to save jobs and restore the economy is a national pandemic strategy, by and large forfeited the issue. <coughs> In the event, 74 million voters last November drank Trump's Kool-Aid. But Trump will never face a Nuremberg moment for these crimes. No American president ever has. 
In preparing the articles of impeachment against Richard Nixon in October 1973, nine Democrats in the House Judiciary Committee joined Republicans to reject John, Connor, John Connor's proposal to make Nixon secret an illegal air war on Cambodia, one of the charges. And like the burglars, they decided, not the bomber. <coughs> Although Merrick Garland, the new attorney general, has signaled his commitment to continue the investigation of the January 6th push, I'm unaware that any Democrat has proposed a criminal investigation of the White House's role in spreading the pandemic nor have the families of COVID vic victims yet banded together as they have in England to demand an inquest with real teeth and political consequence. In the meantime, Republican majorities in the state houses <coughs> are escalating their campaigns against mass mandates and school closures while going to the courts to strip governors of their emergency powers. The American Legislative Exchange Council, known as ALEC, is open right the legislation. Tea Party Patriots, the official name, are providing protesters. And Freedom Works, as it has since 2010, continues to link ersatz populism to billionaire super PAC. Where is the counter movement? Thank you so much for enduring my coffee. Thank you so much, uh, Mike, for that. And uh, you, you got through it and, uh, <laughs> and well done. But uh, I'm sure that was uh, not always easy. All right, so are we gonna take some questions? Or do you wanna take a break beforehand? Let's go for it. All right, please, so please use your, uh, I can't see everybody on the screen because we've got so many people here. But please use your blue hand uh, to say if you have a question. I know there must be some. I will also suggest, Leslie, if you do not disagree, that we might take two, three together so that- Absolutely. Mike has also time to put the reflections together and can also be contribution to the debate, not only a question to him, no? Absolutely. Unless you have a question to start, Marcello. I will leave it to students hopefully first and then yeah. we'll see. Generally, when we start with a very complicated question, then students feel. It's true. Don't be shy. Oh, the new version has a yellow hand in React, says Philip Kelly. OK, well, whatever, whatever it is. I can't see everybody's faces, though. So let me see if I can see anything. Oh, I see. Is that James Sheptiki? All right. Go for it. Hi, Mike. My name is James Sheptiki. I am a sociologist of crime and policing. My question for you is, um, well, I'll just put it in very blunt and simple terms. Um, I like to think in terms of uh, summer riot season and the intensity of summer riot season. And my question for you is, do you think, uh, to what extent do you think the uh, incompetence of the uh, political executive in the United States contributed to the rise of the, uh, um, the Black Lives Matter uh, phenomenon this summer? In other words, absent the COVID crisis, would the summer of 2020 have um, witnessed the same level of political activity uh, from the bottom up that we witnessed this year? Well, I think that uh, there was no question that Trump became the circus master of white supremacism and racial violence in the country. So although the incidents which provoked individual protests were local in nature. 
it was the atmosphere that he created and the legitimacy which he gave to neo-Nazi and racist groups that I think made a lot of people realize that Black Lives Matter was not simply a protest against police abuse. It was the necessary second wave of the civil rights movement. I think the movement needs to deepen in certain ways, recognizing that it's not just the police, but it's the courts, the district attorneys, and the judiciary, which is now totally packed with uh, Trump appointees that have to be the target of our, our, our protests, protests that need to apply pressure on the Biden administration and on the new attorney general to be unflagging in the prosecution of such crimes. Recently in Rochester, as you may know, where a black man was by any criteria simply murdered by the Rochester police. A grand jury refused to prosecute. But New York's African-American attorney general uh, denounced that <coughs> and raised the whole question about uh, county grand juries, which handle such <coughs> cases in the United States, but are notorious for their overwhelmingly white and upper income composition. So this is also a crucial component of the problem that needs, that needs to be addressed. Finally, let me just say that Black Lives Matter, it's been an extraordinary uh, movement and it recycled so much of the energy and hope that younger activists had invested in the Sanders campaign. After Sanders' concession to Biden in March, there was a huge deflation of, of, of hope. And it became obvious that thousands of young activists would drift out of politics. But Black Lives Matter came, came to the rescue. <coughs> And we have in the United States now a kind of paradoxical situation where there's a huge grassroots base for activism protests and for progressive politics. Never has socialism, at least in the abstract, been more popular in this country than it is now. But on the national level, there's no grand coalition you know, national organizations <coughs> able to resource and coordinate protests to develop the new uh, the new politics. I must stress this is in very striking contrast to Europe, because what Europeans and probably many Canadians will see will be blinded by the rise of Trump and the far right and not appreciate the dramatic swing to the left that's occurred uh, in the younger cohorts of the population. <coughs> Thank you. Good. Thanks, I've got a couple of other ones. Why don't we collect, I've got Rishi and then Adam. Rishi, go ahead. I think you're muted. Hi, uh, do you hear me? Yes. Yeah, yeah. I'm from the Netherlands, from Europe. And uh, we were watching America ever since Trump got in office as a reality TV show. Uh, we were uh, mostly laughing at America. And this year has been really a reality TV show to, uh, and the entire, like one, one year ago, he almost started World War III with Iran and then coronavirus came and then Black Lives Matter came. 
and uh, it Black Lives Matter to happen to in Europe, and this was the perfect opportunity for us in Europe because uh, we we need to decolonize so much in Europe. We have a tradition here with blackface, and that's just one example of how structural racism and colonial hangovers are. Um, but a lot of uh, footage from America that came to the Netherlands were actually only rioting. And when I did some research, I found out there were only 200 protests in the entire United States that uh, were escalating uh, from the 8,000 Black Lives Matter movements and that uh, 19%, more than 19% of the entire Black Lives Matter emancipation movement were peaceful. But on ev every uh, protest, there were people with guns coming to them to intimidate them. And I think their lies, uh, that's, that, that just shows how structural and deeply violence has been normalized and chauvinism and fascism has been normalized in America. If you are doing something ethical uh, and do things in solidarity, you're portrayed as the enemy. Uh, and you can come up with a gun in a, that that would be totally illegal. I think you can get deported in a, in Europe in some parts of Europe if you would do that. But it's completely normalized that you can walk with guns to a protest. And I see the police in America siding with those uh, people, and it just shows how. Capitalism, colonialism, fascism, it's all connected, of course, all connected to racism in America. And uh, yeah, to me, I believe in ACAP, all cops are bad, because where are the good cops? I haven't seen one cop in America try to nuance or um, speak out against racism or admitting that there is some institutionalized racism. Um, uh, when I saw the uh, the Capitol riot, uh, or the coup, I think you can call it a coup, uh, I saw cops taking pictures with them and letting them in, and a lot of army veterans were part of it. So it shows how deeply rooted fascism and capitalism, colonialism and racism is in America, in the police, uh, in the military. And that's something quite different than in Europe. Of course, there are there's ethnic profiling, uh, but cops aren't shooting people here for fun. And in America, people, they don't, yeah, they, to me, they lack empathy. If you have a, the power to hold a gun, I think that does something to people that you can have lack of empathy. You, you can get, go in jail here for having a, a weapon. There was some some guy and he went to a news uh, station with a gun and he he went to prison for years and now he's free and now he's doing it he's making videos again with things like fake news and oh that's that's a trend in Europe now fake news uh, Trump influenced Europe to the core the EU is coll work was collapsing uh, Merkel was trying to keep it together and Macron um, Britain left. Uh, there's a lot of uprising of far right in Eastern Europe, in Hungary. In, can you can you uh, try and pull it to pull it towards a question? That would be awesome. Yeah, my, my question is where comes the whole idea of of uh, fascism, racism, colonialism? Uh, where does how did it uh, come so normalized and? Why is the alt right in America so angry? Why why do they want to siege power? What they are angry about, and what what is it that they don't want to lose in America? Okay, good, thank you, Mike. Can I collect a couple of others and then give you a chance? Yeah. All right. So, uh, sure. that, that, no, thanks a lot, Rishi. That's that, I think really important points. Um, Adam. Yes, thank you, uh, thank you, Mike, for your talk. Um, uh, it was wonderful, and, and thank you for the sociology for hosting this talk. I'll make my comment quick. Um, I liked in the beginning how you um, outlined uh, different factors, um, uh, and 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 you were you know posing some of those methodological questions of of, of how do we 
um, you know, view uh, the response, COVID response. So you outlined, um, you know, structural factors like capacities uh, that states have uh, uh, and, and several others as well. And then you also outlined sort of uh, political factors as well, responses from the executive, right? Um, and then there is also a little bit of, of, of historical um, considerations as well, such as, you know, in East Asia, they've had a history with dealing with these pandemics. So my question would be from a, from a comparative perspective, if there is a model or if there's a silver bullet here, um, what model do you think um, uh, represents a case of success? Um, in the pan in the pandemic uh, response, right, with COVID, because you know, in the future, I mean, this is uh, in the future. I think we're going to face uh, more pandemics uh, in our environment. So this type of, you know, um, uh, you know, I I know at the end of the day, it's not about just finding the right model and trying to emulate it. I, I think you lay out the complexity there and many of the factors. But what would you say is 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 the silver silver bullet here? Is it community response? Is it um, the fact, you know, uh, or relatively speaking, which one here uh, is um, illustrates, I think, um, what factor illustrates the best response, pandemic response? Even if it's relative, right? Even if it's, it, it's relative, uh, uh, relatively speaking. I mean, in East Asia, right, it's, it's contingent because of the history. Um, and so on. But here we have more freedoms. There's, you know, there's more of a democracy okay. yet people deny, right? Because people people deny the pandemic because there isn't that tradition of of the state, of the paternal state, right? So it's, it's relative, but what would be the silver bullet? Thank you. Okay, thank you, Adam. And then can we do one more? Yeah, Dean, go for it. And then we'll get to the, some answers. Oh my God, my hair got so messy. So a question in the chat. Michael, thank you so much for such an interesting talk. This idea that Trump should be indicted criminally for the pandemic, I think is something that I had never really thought about, but I think you've, I really, he should be, he should have been impeached for that. Not, not so much for January 6th, but for, for, for the pandemic. And I think that's a really interesting idea. One, one thing that sort of came out of our, our, your talk um, and the discussion of Leo Panich, right? Um, is this idea of international political economy and the way in which international political economy figures into these responses to the pandemic. Um, I'm thinking a lot of a scholar from York named Robert Cox. And one of his key insights was how the international order is manifest in, domest in domestic politics, right? So we only really have a limited number of policies available at any one time. And these are really conditioned by the position of sort of like hedge hegemonic states like the United States and China. And so um, the question that I'm really thinking of is I wonder if, if the sort of different approaches to the pandemic signal a changing international order. All right. Should I go ahead? <laughs> I think you should go for it. You got a lot there and then we've got some more hands. See? Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much for these comments and questions. Imagine that back in the fall of 2019, we kidnapped a group of political scientists, held them in a dark room for all of 2020, and only fed them certain information that there was a pandemic, that the president had failed to keep it under control, had advocated, in fact, a national pandemic strategy, had crusaded against the public health efforts to slow or contain the pandemic, and presided over the loss, which may be permanent, of at least 10 million American jobs, and the 27 other million people lost their work-based health insurance. Okay, so all the political scientists know are these facts. What conclusion would they draw? Undoubtedly, they would say, look, it's obvious. This guy's gonna crash and burn 
in the election. He'll become the most unpopular president in history. This administration is a catastrophe. Yet, in November 9th of last year, 74 million Americans voted for Trump. These include not only his, his hardcore support, you might call it ideological base, but also millions and millions of ordinary people who felt that they had to make a kind of Sophie's choice between the health of their families and their need for income and, and, and work particularly as millions of Americans are on the precipice of being evicted from their homes. So the kind of normal common sense of political science wouldn't have predicted this at all, nor would it probably predicted that Trump's conspiracy theories would it spread internationally like a virus, be adopted with horrendous effects in Brazil by his acolyte Bolsonaro, and even in Mexico by Obrador, elected as a left-wing populist who turned out to be anything but that. And like Trump has scoffed at mask wearing and uh, uh, social distancing. Then in fact, the US example would pump wind into the sails of the far right all across uh, the world. I think that just demonstrates the kind of poverty of existing political knowledge to actually explain what's going on in the world and why it is, I mean, in the two paradoxes I, I attempted to raise in the talk are these. Why is it that Trump-like attempts to undermine public health have gained such popularity, buttressed by a, a new and growing culture of anti-science? But secondly, why the first set of parameters I outlined, trying to define uh, social, scientific, and political capacities to act against the pandemic led to such strange results, where it's almost impossible in many cases to show any connection between income level <coughs> or even public provision of medicine, of healthcare, to the actual result. Now, I think we're lacking essential elements of, of a class analysis here, particularly discounting the role of the middle classes, small businesses, and regional elites in the creation and growth of the new far right. It's so often simply depicted as kind of revolt to the white underclass as a blue collar phenomena, it isn't. I mean, we've been debating the nature of national socialism for almost 90 years. But it keeps the, the balance of historical opinion comes back to the conclusion that the real base of the Nazi party were not German workers. They were peasants, white collar workers and state employees, lawyers, professors, and family owned uh, businesses to which the German manufacturers added their support around 1931 and 1932. I'm not suggesting that fascism is a sufficiently developed concept to apply to things today, but some of the similarities are profoundly, uh, profoundly striking. You have to also understand 
look at what's happened from the standpoint of household economic logic. If you're a small business person in say San Francisco, you're probably a liberal Democrat. But on the other hand, you might easily come to see <coughs> the public health campaign against COVID as threatening your, your extinction because the Republicans, for instance, in Congress have blocked the kind of aid that small businesses have needed to survive. Members of the essential workforce, those most exposed to the pandemic, have to sit down every evening and calculate a trade-off <clears throat> between guarding the health of older family members or their own problems with pre-existing conditions <coughs> against their need for income. Something like 42 to 45 percent of Americans consistently poll that they live week to week, month to month, with no income reserves, with, with no reservoir of wealth uh, uh, to draw on. We drastically underestimated the precariousness of ordinary life in the United States. The product of the defeat of unions, beginning of the Reagan administration, and the deliberately well-designed upward trans transfer of wealth. Now, it's entirely right to say that we live in an age of pandemics. And also to link that to the global economic activities that modified nature and exposed the planet to reservoirs of viruses and in some cases bacteria, which we've largely been protected from by, for instance, the great rainforests of the world. <clears throat> And one of the most telling studies <coughs> that I know of, and I discussed this years ago in my book on avian flu, Monster at the Door, was a study that showed how in West Africa, the most rapidly urbanizing part of the world, people in cities have traditionally been dependent on fish protein. But starting in the 80s and 90s, Big factory fleets from Spain and Japan, Russia started showing up in the Gulf of Guinea. And according to the scientific estimates, vacuumed up something like 40% of the fish biomass in the Gulf of Guinea. Fish prices soared, putting pro the major protein source out of reach of people in West African slums. But at the same time, Western multinational logging companies were ravaging rainforests in countries like the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Gabon, uh, uh, Cameroon. And to keep costs down, they were hiring hunters to kill wild animals to feed their logging trees. People in the cities, desperate for protein, created a market well beyond that of uh, logging workers for so-called bush meat some 70 different species of reptiles and, and, and mammals uh, comprise this diet. So here you see an example where two unrestrained international sectors of capital, corporate fishing and logging, break down the barriers between populations and, and wilderness. 
<coughs> unleashing viruses that spread. And the result, of course, was HIV and then Ebola. So international political economy framework is absolutely necessary to understand how pandemic disease is an integral part of the larger global uh, crisis. Why it's increasingly meaningless to try and put pandemics, climate change, the world water crisis, et cetera, into completely different categories. Great. Can I can I give you some other questions? Yeah. Okay. So there's a couple in the chat, and then I've got Adam and Jordy there from Frederick Peters. Uh, this one's about potential strategy. Shall people take to the streets or the courts or the national inquiry route for addressing government failures around COVID? Each has its appeal and problems. Your thoughts. And then from Jin Mai. I'm just trying to find your question. Unless you want to say it or, oh yes. Um, the world has never been so divided. We live in the world with our friends, neighbors and family members who hold very different views from us. How do we live in this polarized society? Is there anything in particular we can do to make everyone listen to each other? Foundational question. And uh, Adam King. Yeah. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yep. Okay, good. Um, so, I mean, we're in a situation in rich countries like Canada, you know, where there's hoarding of vaccines or over procuring them at the same time that the government is pretty pathetic in terms of its rollout strategy for actually vaccinating the population. So this seems to me to put the left in a kind of terrible predicament in that we have to make the case for the need and necessity of, of internationalism, of solidarity, at the same time that our own states are doing such a horrible job serving their own population. So I wondered if you had any thoughts about how to sort of address this, this problem. All right. You want to go ahead or shall I ask Jordy for his as well? Let's, let's, let's go there. Let's with these, these first. Yeah. I read the other day in the paper that, what is it called, Codex? This is the international consortium <coughs> to purchase vaccines for distribution in poor countries. That is something like 20 or $40 billion short of the promised contributions from wealthy countries. This repeats a pattern that's defined the last generation of, of, of the World Health Organization activities. Countries promise to contribute. Uh, they get, you know, wonderful media moments where their minister of international aid or whatever it is, foreign minister gets up and says, we're giving so much in this, but they don't actually give it. They don't come through on it. This is an incredible emergency. Uh, right now. But traditionally, where do you look for consistent internationalism? I think I'm only in two places. From parts of the Christian community, there are other religious communities, and from the historical left. One of my criticisms of the left in my country it's despite the fact that it has a resonance and potential for growth beyond anything we've seen since at least the beginning of the 20th century. It's very dangerously close to embracing a kind of progressive version of America first. If you listen to democratic primary debates in this country, both Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders advocated wonderful <clears throat> policies, stood up for working people, denounced racists, 
but had almost nothing to say about global poverty, about corporate exploitation of, of poor countries. Maybe they didn't say it because nobody bothered to even ask them uh, the questions. So I see a very uh, big deficit of internationalism within the ranks of the left. And unfortunately that's true in so many other countries as well. <coughs> and the American left needs to emblazon on its banners, tithing to the International uh, Fund for Vaccine Distribution, but more importantly, to revive the idea of social medicine. Once upon a time, the world public health efforts were divided into two camps. On the American side, dominated by the Rockefeller Foundation between the wars and later by American representatives to the WHO, was the idea of focusing just on pathogens or their vectors like mosquitoes. So it kind of militarized campaigns focusing on the disease, but not on the poor health conditions, the poverty that made large populations, particularly in tropical countries, so vulnerable <coughs> to those pathogens. But on the other side, and embraced both by social democrats and communists and descendant from the father of pathology, Rudolf Virchow, the German doc, famous German doctor who'd been a veteran of 1848, was the idea that the focus should be on primary care, on primary health, and that that required radical social reforms, including unions and land reform to increase people's income level. The last real appearance of this social medicine idea was in 1979 at the WHO summit in Alma Alta in Kazakhstan. And the declaration that was ad adopted there made basic <coughs> affordable healthcare <clears throat> a human right and reinforced the focus on the general health of people in poor countries or, or, or colonial countries. We need to revisit this, this old debate. We need to understand that the worst outcome to all this might be that in the rich countries, people finally get vaccinated <clears throat> and then their governments <coughs> declare the war, the war is over without addressing the huge disinvestment that's occurred in public health, all the great inequities in rich countries in the provision of, of, of healthcare, much less the fact that in large parts of the world, Primary healthcare is virtually collapsed, destroyed by war, civil war, and in many cases, simply by debt. So it's really incumbent upon progressives <coughs> and the broad left <clears throat> to light a fire under the idea of the Alma Alta Declaration, the tradition of social medicine and radical social reform as the path to guarantee everyone's human right uh, to healthcare. Finally, a last point. Why should we bring people together? Okay, who wants, who believes they can actually heal the divisions <clears throat> the political polarization in this country, not just a matter of 
right-wing control of the media in vast parts of the Midwest and South. It's not a result of honest difference. It's an X-ray of underlying divisions in this country, class, racial, ethnic divisions. They've been there a, a long time, okay? Things that have happened during the Trump administration <coughs> happened in the South in the civil rights era, happened in the 1920s <clears throat> when the Ku Klux Klan grew like a hothouse flower in Midwestern and Eastern states in opposition to new immigrants, Catholic and Jewish new immigrants. The foundation of American history is after all slavery. This is why years ago during Occupy New York, and I got in some trouble for this, I attacked the idea of the evil 1%. 40% of the American population today or yesterday <clears throat> has material interests that tie it to right wing and potentially uh, fascist policies. Maybe that's because I grew up in a working class suburb, which was politically dominated by the uh, <coughs> far right, John Birch Society uh, in particular. And during the 60s, comrades would tell me, oh, you know, the revolution's within sight. I said, are you kidding? Unless you confront the nature of the American middle class and all of its components, and the material interests that tie people to racism, to exploitation uh, at the workplace. You'll never really understand what we need to do or how to do it. That was grim, I'm sorry. But it's what yeah, I no. Is that, are you good? Do you want to do you want to stop now or there's, there's I see three more questions right now. Do you want to do a last round? Let's hear three more people. OK, uh, I've got one direct message. Trump boasted that he from Rita Kanark. Trump, Trump boasted that he'd asked his officials to slow down COVID testing because the rising number of cases was making him look bad. Does this constitute a clear crime against humanity for which Trump could be charged? That's the first one. Uh, the second, Jordy, I know. You were on the queue, Jordy Cummings? Yeah, I'm um, sorry. Yeah, I was having some technical difficulties, so I missed some of the last answer. So per pardon me if um, some of what I ask um, might repeat, because um, uh, my question was not unrelated to threads. Um, so this afternoon, I, a member of the uh, Academic Reserve Army of Labor here at York, and I lucked out in uh, scoring, scoring uh, a course previously taught by David McNally, a Marxist theory course in the Department of Politics. And uh, it just so happens that this afternoon that we had uh, a session on COVID, including some of your work, and predominantly students were engaging with uh, Paniotis uh, Soteris's um, interventions um, from last year. Your Mike, you're probably um, familiar with um, his somewhat strange um, counterposition of what he frames as biopolitics from below, these networks of uh, mutual aid and so forth that form to arguably push the state and push the powers that be to implement any such policies to contain and perhaps reverse and prevent virus uh, development. And I'm glad you mentioned examples in China. But Satiris uh, counterposes this to what he kind of in a sort of quasi Foucauldian idiom refers to as the lockdown policy and language that you would sometimes find in a different register from the far right. Um, and kind of resuscitating arguments about the non-neutrality of science and so on. And I'm just wondering what you make of that and also some of the resistance, the criti criticism of your work and, and, and Andreas Malm's work um, with regard from some of the anarchist left with regards to appeals to the state, so to speak, and the seeming, and it is difficult to be an abolitionist, uh, to be a prison uh, anti-carceral leftist, but also 
want, as you do, to uh, prosecute <laughs> the, the fash, uh, so to speak, right now. So um, I, I guess what I'm getting at is that there's there seems to be a difficulty in some circles um, of the left right now in theory and practice in reconciling some seemingly on principle, seemingly in practice, incommensurable positions. So I, I'm just wondering, I'm, I know that was a big question. I kind of had it prepared, but then I had computer issues, but um, yeah, um, and really a pleasure to hear you speak. Thanks. Awesome, thanks, uh, Jordi. So what is to be done? Uh, and uh, Ilan, uh, last one. Uh, thanks, Mike, for your great talk. Um, so just as you said that uh, socialism has never been more popular than, than now, at least in the United States, I wonder whether what you think of the view that um, one of the unexpected impacts of COVID has been the return of the state um, um, because of the need for socialized medicine, as you, as you, as you were talking about, um, but, but also who would have thought, you know, just over a year ago that states across the world would be intervening to constrain the market in serious ways because of COVID, uh, that states would suddenly find all kinds of money uh, for welfare and aid programs that, that you know, uh, was not available before COVID. Um, that we that across the world we're seriously um, engaging in conversations about the need for universal basic income. That whole conversation has come back again. Um, so, in other words, in other words, has COVID not brought about a whole new um, um, set of possibilities, which might, of course, go the alt right route and has, but might it not go the other way as well? Thanks. Should I answer? <clears throat> One of the, the most curious features <coughs> of Trump's election was the very minor role played by what we traditionally consider to be big businesses, uh, Fortune 500 corporations, the biggest banks, and so on. He gained their support by giving away the candy store to them through deregulation, and labor standards and environmental standards through directly pumping money to them and all kinds of ways. But their relationship to the regime is very different, say, from what it had been in the Reagan period, when there's the most powerful peak organization of American big business in American history called the Business Roundtable that rallied to Reagan in order to destroy a labor movement, <coughs> which it thought was preventing it from competing uh, with the Japanese or European uh, uh, manufacturers. This is as close as you'd come to kind of executive committee, the ruling class. But not this time around. Who is in power? Well, billionaires, but the peculiar class of nouveau riche billionaires whose headquarters were in places like Battle Run, Michigan, or uh, Chattanooga, Tennessee, Omaha, Topeka, uh, Wichita Falls, Tulsa. And they weren't just oil billionaires who've been financing the far right since the 1950s, but people whose fortunes in many ways were elected, rested upon government re, uh, deregulation or tolerance of things like usury, <coughs> as in the case of payday loan corporations. <clears throat> And they seem to have acquired an almost inexplicable power over government policy during the first three years of the Trump administration. And they had previously built an extraordinary infrastructure <coughs> for influencing and controlling state government. That's what the 
Tea Party movement was. But what happened after Trump's defeat in late November, December, was really fascinating because it seemed that the penny finally dropped and Wall Street and big corporations and even small ones recognized that the far right, which they'd sponsored, the Trump cult that they'd sponsored, however much it had given away to them and adopted key parts of the agenda was incapable of guaranteeing the essential conditions for the reproduction of advanced industrial <coughs> economy. Now, the Ur Republican organization, okay, the grandfather of all, is the National Association of Manufacturers <coughs> created by the McKinley camp during the election of 1896. And it's always been, and it groups together large corporations, but especially family-owned and medium-sized corporations. Its president came out right after the election when Trump launched his campaign uh, to reverse the vote and actually said that the 25th Amendment, which provides the removal of presidents under you know, they're incapable of governing one reason or another, be used to remove Trump. And it, of course, has led to a split uh, in the Republican uh, 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 Party. So you might say that for fascism to work or for the, the uh, postmodern far right to stay in power, it has to fulfill these basic existence conditions for the system as a whole. And when it became clear that Trump wasn't doing this, and that he was in danger of wrecking uh, the whole story, they split from him. Although he still has a long afterlife guaranteed by the 140 members of Congress that remain loyally uh, on his side. <coughs> Finally, about bringing the state back in. Uh, and about the question of progressives suddenly advancing justifications for de undemocratic abuses of, 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 of power. Well, almost everybody I know here in my little world and the San Diego left. <coughs> it's been deeply worried about all the talk about insurrection, the need for new uh, anti-terrorism legislation. And as we all know through historical appearance, experience, that the same laws and the same repressive powers will be used in the future against people's movements. I'm not saying that the right-wing militias and terrorists shouldn't be, shouldn't be prosecuted, but we don't need to increase. There are already huge surveillance and carceral powers of the state in doing that. But we should also remember that <coughs> problem in the most important debate at during the golden age of socialism and that led to the splintering of the second international it was over this question of reform and revolution and it was the position of some that can only stand for revolution reforms of anything disarm people before the test ahead of them. But the great majority of left socialists, including people like Rosa Luxemburg and Lenin, said, no, you can demand 
that the state conduct reforms and act in a responsible way vis-a-vis -vis the public interest, while at the same time you're trying to overthrow that same state and build a more democratic uh, uh, society. Now, certainly some of the actions taken around quarantines and so on have been ham-handed and to the democratic governors that, been, that were previously extolled for their uh, role in containing the pandemic, Gavin Newsom in California and Andrew Cuomo in New York, is now clear they've been almost criminally negligent themselves in failing to prevent <coughs> deaths in the rest homes, and act consistent policies, or in the case of Como, we're actually covering up uh, 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 crucial data. And the left should jump on these on these questions. But by and large, what has been implemented is not a new repressive power of the state. It's the ancient common sense uh use since the renaissance <coughs> to deal <coughs> with out of control epidemic diseases particularly you know novel ones and the trumpites who celebrate american tradition and the lost values of a family-based white civilization and so on are the ones who've broken most radically with the acceptance of the need for such members. That, that's, for instance, to deal with yellow fever epidemics through the 19th century or cholera, or the Spanish flu in 1918, repudiate these as actions of a strong state. But of course, the repudiation is all part of a strategy of conferring even more autocratic powers on right-wing state legislatures and upon the, uh, uh, you know, the White House. The telling moment for me <coughs> was in April and May when there were something like 500 rank and file wildcat strikes and job actions across the country, nurses and Amazon uh, uh, employees, postal workers, all the Americans in the essential workforce who were faced with the greatest, greatest risk went out spontaneously on strikes. Only a few of them were actually coordinated by unions, demanding protective equipment and workplace safety. It's at that moment that progressives should have joined them in the streets because as Black Lives Matter showed later in the early summer, <coughs> it's quite possible uh, to protest as long as you, you know, follow the elementary uh, precautions. None of the Black Lives Matter protests turned into super spreader votes. We should have never abdicated the streets. But above all, we should have built a movement to support this rank and file upsurge. It didn't happen. Instead, the movement became the mobs carrying guns into state capitals demanding an end to uh, closures. It became the crowds at the massless <coughs> Trump rallies. The truth is, the Republicans know how to use extra parliamentary protest as an integral part of, of politics. The Democrats seem to, you know, apart from the most progressive members, seem to regard this uh, as something like horde. Let's all work it out on the for Congress or by elections. <clears throat> but we know that progressives 
and elected positions are only empowered when the movements in the streets and the workplaces okay, are raising the demands and pushing them forward and creating the conditions in which basic changes and reforms can occur. Yeah, absolutely. The streets are absolutely crucial. Listen, Mike, do you want to do another round or are you, I think that's, that's been incredible to hear so much strategic depth and thinking, but it's up to you. Well, people want to add comments. I welcome them. Sure. Okay. Do people want to have comments, especially people who haven't spoken yet? Sorry to say, you know, shut you down, Rishi. But are there other folks who really want to chime in? By the way, hi, Leah, my old friend. Hi, Mike. Nice to see you. Wonderful to hear your voice, but I can't see you. We're very old and dear friends. Wonderful. Leah, would you want to chime in? I would just say, as usual, Mike has given us so much to think about. Some of it we know, and some of it we just need to be reminded one more time, again and again. So no, I just want to say thank you, Mike. Thank you for this presentation. Thank you for your generosity in answering question, and thank you for all your work. Goodness. Yes. I second that. All right. Anna, you've turned your camera on. Do you have a do you have a, a thought you wanted to share? Well, I just I just wanted to say that the NLR series was really really brilliant, and um, I mean your work is always brilliant, but it just shed so much clear light on everything that's happened over the last year. And so, you know, thank you for doing that work, and and yeah, it's just really greatly appreciated. Sure, Thank sure. you. Thank you. And I see Joe Haynes has a question or a comment. Hello, yes. Uh, thank you. Um, and thanks to Mike, of course. Um, it's a little late here in London, so I hope you'll forgive me if, I, um, if I'm not as uh, concise as I might be. <clears throat> I've got a question about um, popular protest and power over the last over the last period in in britain and in europe <clears throat> um mike i think i've read, read you before saying that it was a mistake for progressives and leftists to abandon the streets since the um start of the pandemic um with the with the um the the exception of, of the Black Lives Matter protests, uh, showing that it was safe from a public health perspective and showing just how much power can be exercised uh, uh, by regular people uh, joining together. <clears throat> but then looking across, across Europe, um, there's just been such a lack of anything but uh, the either solidarity protests with BLM or kind of national iterations of it. So I wonder if it, if it is indeed a question of abandonment, which suggests uh, a, a kind of subjective factor uh, or the importance of that subjective factor. But then we're talking about dozens of countries, dozens of national lefts in which one really hasn't seen any kind of action perhaps i've missed something i know there's been efforts in italy but they were spontaneous and over very quickly so i just wonder if that formulation of abandonment is the right one and whether in fact there are these much much deeper forces keeping people at home and at this point i appreciate there is one of course it's the pandemic but it's about the response the political response uh uh to that what more could have been done i suppose in other words uh, to 
um, you know, uh, and not give up that power as you um, as you argued against. Cool. Thanks. Good one. Uh, and Anna, you wanted to throw something in as well. Um, well, first of all, one of the things I didn't say earlier is thank you for the great talk. And I was in and out because I was dealing with a small child. So I may have missed um, a comment on the second question I'll ask. But the first one is just your observations about the way, um, you know, conventional sources and the mainstream media covered the Chinese response to COVID. Um, you talked a little bit about sort of the dissidents talking about uh, solidarity, um, you know, community solidarity. I was wondering if you, if you had, you know, if you want, if there was something else you could share about that. And then the other is, and you may have, have referenced this, um, but I, I may have missed it, but because I, I heard the portion about when you were talking about some of the issues in the West African continent or context. And I know that there have been some observations made that in fact, you know, COVID was very well managed in that region of the world, that there was sort of a recognition of um, how one could uh, by neighborhood quarantine in cases of individual, you know, in cases of, given that there was limited testing capacity, if there was a single case, for instance, an apartment block was, would be shut down for two weeks and that this is one of the ways that they were able to prevent a broader outbreak. And I'm just wondering your observations on that, whether you think that's an accurate um, dis description of how it was handled in some, in some parts of West Africa or not. Should I go ahead? Yeah, go for it. <laughs> well, just, and as I pointed out in the talk, just as if, as, <coughs> If one use the abstract indices of wealth, efficiency, uh, governments and administrations, uh, uh, universal health care, to predict outcomes in countries, you're immediately confronted with this paradox that in most countries in Western Europe, in fact, failed. And we need to, to understand why that, why that happened. I wrote at the very beginning in March that I thought that pre-existing diseases, sanitation, and all the congested crowded conditions of life in African and South Asian slums basically constituted an immunologically distinct humanity, which was ripe for mass death during a pandemic. That hasn't happened, thank God. But we're still in the dark about what's going on. Clearly, a country like Rwanda has had great success. South Africa, the richest country in uh, the continent, has had an aggressive campaign, but in many ways it's, it's, it's been defeated. So the verdict is still out on this. As you saw from the talk, I'm particularly <coughs> interested in the role of self-organization by neighborhoods by ordinary uh, 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 people. And we really don't understand enough about that. This is why the Chinese case is so important. But because truly Xi is trying to construct uh, a brave new world in China, uh, a total surveillance <clears throat> society. And that's why we should unstimulingly support the Uyghurs and the protesters in Hong Kong and so on. But in other respects, China is not the, you know, the closed, totally authoritarian society uh, that is portrayed every day 
for instance, in the American media, its scientific es establishment, beginning with the Wuhan Institute of Virology, has been entirely open and has participated in an international collaboration that medical research in the science of the world universally applied. The Wuhan government covered up uh, the initial days of the pandemic. But China's medical establishment and, 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 and researchers have been, behaved with, uh, in an open way and, and even with heroism. Plus, as in the case of this book I referred to, uh, the Senate's live and well in China. <clears throat> and the neighborhood actions and the role of people like the, the Chinese New Left exist side by side with an even greater uh, amount of activism by Chinese workers. China is constantly boiling with small scale rank and file strikes. Government has prevented uh, them from cohering into larger movements. But the level of protest and resistance, potential for that, remains very high in China. China, after all, is the, the actually existing pages of the commune of the of Das Kapital. It has the largest blue collar working class in the world. It has, combines all the conditions that Marx described uh, in capital. We, sh we should not imagine that Chinese working people and students uh, are in any way permanently silenced in China, don't have the potential to bring about enormous change. <coughs> now, the business press in the United States has recently been excited by the idea that once enough people have been vaccinated and there's herd immunity, there's going to be this incredible boom. All the money people have stored away will be spent on new goods, particularly if the uh, Stimulus checks uh, are passed by the uh, by the Democrats, and in fact that may occur, but it will be short lived. The pandemic only accentuated and accelerated the economic contradictions that are the legacy of 2008, of an economy where good jobs, high wage jobs continue to disappear, where peripherality and gig employment grows ever more than the only real life choice, not only for poor working people, but for downly mobile college uh, graduates. This is a tremendous material factor in, uh, in the Sanders campaign. So we have to gird ourselves all over the world to social conditions more like the Great Depression. In the background, environmental deterioration, climate change and in, in, in disease, disease will continue to destabilize uh, you know, societies. We need to look back on harder times of the 20th century to understand the kind of movements and the kind of organizations that will be necessary. Now, to answer to address the question from London, people, working people in the United States are in revolt, people in desperate circumstances, which is why solidarity with their protests, either through unions or uh, movements against uh, 
eviction, whatever. It's so important that there's an active solidarity campaign to bring support to these struggles because that kind of solidarity will redefine what the progressive movement is, what the left uh, is. And it's just appalling that apart from Black Lives Matter, the, the major movement in the streets has been of the, you know, of, of the far right. We really must uh, get our act together. And where people are fighting, we must go and give them uh, uh, our support. And there will be lots and lots of rebellion, lots and lots of fights over the next year or two. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, I see it's, I know it's five to seven. I see one new questioner, but I also, did you get, can you want to fit in one more? Sure. Sure. Okay. And then we're going to, I'm going to make everybody turn off their, uh, turn on their mics and try and do an applause on Zoom, which I don't know. If it, so Hira, sing, please. It was all that conversation of the fighting in the streets, wasn't it? Hira? Okay. It's. Mike, it, it was excellent. And there's so many, you have raised many more questions than, than uh, uh, we can uh, really pay attention. But I wanted to add something and wanted to know from you. One, I think uh, what this pandemic and the current situation requires is uh, rethinking the whole theory of social movements. I think beginning with the 1980s, social movements have been hijacked by all kinds of fashionable names and labels, which is what the mainstream social sciences always do, and killing the movement in that process. So, so what this pandemic, along with other crises that's going on, we have to rethink about social movements. That's, that's one. Two, there is a very interesting case going on in India. I'm sure you must be paying attention to that. There is a movement there. In spite of the pandemic, in spite of the Hindu fundamentalism, in spite of the semi-fascist method Naren Modi is trying to govern India, the peasants in India, the farmers, have been agitating precisely against the neoliberalism. We have a strange situation in India where a Hindu fundamentalism, uh, praying to gods on the one hand and fooling the masses, on the other hand, falling at the feet of IMF and, and neoliberalism. Two kinds of contradictory worship is going on there, but defying all that. Indian farmers are there in the streets. And uncompromising instance, uncompromising, they are saying nothing except our demands, otherwise we are not going. And there are so many beautiful things about that movement, which I don't have time to talk here, is that it's amazing for any student of social movement right now in the midst of all kinds of contradictions. And, uh, Yes, I'll, I'll just stop there. Thanks, Yara. I'm so glad that you uh, reminded us of the importance of the struggle in India and the need to give it international bank backing. Of course, it seems that almost all of South Asia and Southeast Asia is aflame these days. People's movements in Burma, mm. in Thailand, uh, gargantuan social forces are mobilizing. Lots of social volcanoes will erupt. But from the narrow perspective of, 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 of my country, I want to raise two questions. One is, that even if you discount the whole Bolshevik experience, Stalinist, small Trotskyist groups, the whole idea of cadre parties, 
it still seems to me to be sociologically inevitable that you have to address the question of the need for an organization of organizers. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. Who can bring into popular struggles mm -hmm. longer term perspectives, inject uh, international solidarity, and so on, and allow people to act in a more strategic way. But secondly, I see in the United States a big discrepancy between who actually fights in the streets <coughs> and who dominates uh, what there is of an institutional left, like democratic socialist America and, and, and Jacobin. Organizations need to be real expressions of the people they appoint to be their, their heroes and social base. And that means creating organizations that allow younger working people, poor people, to be able to lead lives of struggle. Graduate students, of course, can more or less self-finance uh, their activism, but others can't. And I see this through the perspective. I have four children, two are Irish citizens. My younger kids, still in high school, believe it or not, uh, identify with their mother as being Mexican. And they go to an inner city high school, San Diego High. And they were you know, very active in Black Lives Matter protests. But what was so striking to me is they weren't the only ones. All their friends were, and their friends are working class Mexican immigrant kids, the Somali, Somali kids whose fathers drive, drive ta taxis, you know, working class African American kids. And they're joined together almost spontaneously by their hatred of racism, discrimination, and police violence. But they're also incredibly radical and in trying to convince my kids even though they're too young to vote last november on the case for the need to vote for biden i felt like a menshevik talking to the bolsheviks the group of bolshevik uh uh of workers this younger generation under 30 generation is one of the most distinctive in all of american history in its values in its rejection, race and gender discrimination, but above all in its belief that the future is only possible through absolutely radical changes. And that nothing less than that is worth even uh, considering. So to organize this power, to precipitate this power. I think that you then need to revisit this question of an organization of organizers. But even more importantly, you have to try and figure out how we need to support young people to live these lives of struggle and to deal with the, you know, the emergencies and necessities uh, of their lives. Uh, Black Lives Matter is the senior authority on this question because it has mobilized so many you know working class kids and it's directly addressed uh these issues so ultimately in, we need to do everything possible to keep this movement and its agenda uh alive because it's a foundation for whatever we will build in the future thank you so much Thank you, Mike. I want to welcome, I get everybody to turn on their mic, their things and clap if we can. There's no better place to end. Yay. Bravo. Bravo. So Bravo. appreciated. And thank you all for coming. I think this is a really rich discussion and uh, we clearly have a lot to do. Right. And read Leo Panitch. His work read is, Leo Panitch. is as relevant and important as ever. <laughs>